Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for this conversation this morning. My name is Savannah Sellers. Um, I'm an anchor and correspondent at NBC News and NBC News Now, and I feel so grateful to be in gorgeous Aspen in the summer with this fabulous panel. Um, I'll go down the line and kind of introduce everyone and then kind of set the scene. Um, right next to me here is Monica Haslip. She's the founder and executive director of Little Black Pearl. Here for Monica. <laughs> Next to Monica, we have a Rabbi Jonah Pesner. He's the director at the Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism. Here for Rabbi Jonah. And Vicki Stodd is on the end, senior program officer of the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. And today, we are all here to have this conversation about racial healing. And I think part of what's really important about this conversation is actually defining that and talking through examples of what that looks like in a community. So that's going to be part of our goal, talking through some real examples, as these are all leaders in their communities that have been doing work like that. And before we actually get into the conversation, I want to show you something, because the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, I do also want to note, has been an editorial sponsor for us at NBC Universal, where actually after last year's Ideas Festival, we really went deep by creating this whole series surrounding this to kind of help do what I just described, define some of this and put some examples around it. We had some of our fabulous NBC News journalists traveling the country to tell some of these stories. So it all started here last year and we're going to take a look at that right now. Welcome to our town hall on the National Day of Racial Healing, an event created six years ago by our sponsor, the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. Muy buenas noches. Gracias a todos por acompañarnos en este Día Nacional de Sanación Racial. The Kellogg Foundation is joining forces with the NBC Universal News Group on an editorial collaboration focused on racial equity and healing sponsored by the foundation. Racial equity is about the transformation that needs to take place, but healing is the path by which you get there. Join us over the next few weeks as my colleagues here at NBC News travel to four cities to meet with the incredible people who are working tirelessly to change the narrative. It is not enough to say I'm not a racist. It's not enough to say I won't heal it. Racial healing is this awareness of collective responsibility mm -hmm. and showing up. We might not have a title, it's still our land because we're indigenous to this country. There's still a lot of healing to be done, but we've come a long way. We're highlighting one school in Albuquerque, New Mexico. They are working tirelessly to heal the next generation of Native American students. Healing means that you see your ancestors and the plight they had and try to understand why it's important to remember their struggles. Hoy es el día en que todos podemos comenzar a dar nuestros primeros pasos para continuar la lucha y la marcha por la justicia que hicieron el Dr. King y César Chávez. En estas conversaciones siempre debemos que centrar el amor de nosotros y de nuestra humanidad. A lot of people think that Asian Americans and API communities at large are doing better than most. And I think that is such a harmful rhetoric. We deny our children truth and they love truth. They desire truth. Who does the narrative benefit? And when you question that, then you begin to realize that there are powerful interests that don't want us to understand that history, that don't want us to understand our common struggle. We are in a dire situation right now, and town halls like this are critical to bring this attention to all. All right. So again, all got started last year. And in that year, we've done a lot of great work together. And Vicki, I want to start with you um, and this partnership with W.K. Kellogg Foundation. And we heard a little snippet of this, which I think was such a powerful soundbite there in that piece. But just how does the W.K. Kellogg Foundation define racial healing specifically? And then talk a little bit about the difference between that and the concept of racial equity. Thank you so much for framing the question that way. And I, I think before I begin, I just want to sort of briefly reintroduce myself, and that is because we, uh, some of my indigenous relatives in the room, I just want to say, Hainapi, Hijakishna, Hinikana, Gawina. My name is Scott Exchange Ka, 
and that translates to white fawn in the English language. And I'm from the Ho-Chunk Nation of Wisconsin, and I'm a member of the Hoonch, the Bear Clan. And for me, that's, it's a peace-building role. And so I just wanted to acknowledge my indigenous family in this space in this way. And working at the Kellogg Foundation, part of our journey has, has been extensive over many, many decades of focus on, focusing on racial equity work. And over many years, it has taken on various forms and iterations, and the way that we define racial equity is, is really creating the conditions in society that allow every single human being to thrive and to experience well-being in a just society. In some sense, we couple racial equity with racial healing. Our intention is that every single human being whatever your race, whatever your ethnic background, that you will have equal opportunity to be successful in this world. And this also means that the predictors for your, your life will be dependent in some sense on creating a just society. It's also connected to being able to honor each and every single person's humanity in this world. It's also connected to how we look at racial equity. In some sense, we frame it as systems transformation, and we couple it with the racial healing work. In some sense, when I think about defining racial healing and what that means, for me, I often describe racial equity and racial healing as two sides of the same coin. Mm. One is needed for the other. As we unearth the issues and Im the impact of systemic racism in this country, it also unearths so much of the legacy and the trauma and the oppressive systems that we have inherited from generations before us. And so when we unearth that, there's a lot of healing work that needs to happen as we develop relationships in community, as we create community transformation to address systemic racism, to dismantle it, we need strong and healthy relationships in order to do collective work for human liberation. Mm, absolutely. I, feel free to clap throughout. <laughs> um, Monica, I want to bring you in here to talk about the work that you are doing that she just was referencing in a community. Yeah. Um, I'm going to have another question for you in just a moment because you're also a racial healing practitioner, and yeah. I want to talk about what that actually looks like tangibly. But first, tell us about the Little Black Pearl and what it is that you're doing in a community that correlates with exactly what Vicki was just describing. Yeah, I mean, at Little Black Pearl, we're in Chicago on the south side. A lot of our work really has centered around making the connection between art, education, and business. Uh, but, you know, a part of what we've been trying to do is to make sure that uh, we are in an environment where uh, people of color can come and develop skills and leadership so they can begin to access the creative industries at a higher level. Uh, one of the challenges we've faced in most cases is that we're entering the creative industries in these low-level positions. At Little Black Pearl, we spend our time really trying to prepare our BIPOC leaders for the next phase where they can actually participate in defining uh, what the creative industries is doing and how we're doing it. So, a lot of our work really tries to prep them for that. And yeah. tell us about the importance of that, about kind of developing leaders so that yes. there's more of that representation. Yeah, I, I think as a BIPOC leader, you know, uh, even speak, thinking about myself, I've been doing the work um, as a founder of the organization for 30 years. And when I think about all of the trauma and the challenges and the barriers that I've had to overcome in order to really build an institution, mm. I realized that there were others that were coming behind me that were trying to do the same thing, that were trying to create organizations in their communities, that were trying to create access for people. And so it became increasingly important to me that some of the lessons that we've learned, some of the things that we've uh, moved beyond, we were able to share that with uh, leaders who were emerging, leaders who were actually taking, you know, the mantle and moving forward. And, and you know, one of the things I've always been concerned about was, you know, the work is such a heavy lift. And so how do you invite people to continue to do this work in our community? And so the way we do that 
is we give them environments where they too can heal. Mm -hmm. We give them environments where they have the supports that they need so they can learn and have the tools to endure and withstand and move beyond some of the barriers that are put in front of us as people of color as we are trying to build institutions around the country. And particularly as we try to enter the creative industries at higher levels. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm going to come back to you in just a moment okay. on racial healing practitioner. Um, but Rabbi Pesner, I want to bring you in to talk about the work in your community. And I very much appreciate it in our conversations prior to being here on this stage today as we prepared for this. Uh, the way that you describe the role that you take as who you are as an individual, as well as what this type of work means for your community and linking arms with other communities. Walk us through that. Sure. Thank you. And I... I'm just so honored to be part of this incredible conversation with Monica and with Vicki, who are my teachers in this work. Mm. Um, and I'm a rabbi, so forgive me, I'm gonna invoke a blessing of gratitude. Mm. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, shachianu v'kiyamanu v'higianu lazman hazeh. Thank you, God, for bringing us life, sustaining us, and bringing us to this moment. We're in this beautiful space. We're with these beautiful people and we're actually having a conversation about how we might confront the 400 years of the theft of native lands, the enslavement of African people, and the systems of racism and oppression that keep all of us enslaved, and none of us will be free until all of us are free. Mm. So I'm grateful to God and my spirituality, I don't mean to impose on others, oh. for the opportunity to actually build the world as it could be, a world in which all of us thrive. So for me as a Jew, as you invoked your family narrative, I came to this place because my grandma Fanny at age 16 escaped the pogroms, the violence of Europe. There is no record of my family's history other than 1916 when she arrived at Ellis Island. And on the one hand, she discovered a land of opportunity. But it turns out in retrospect, she discovered whiteness. Mm -hmm. Because for centuries, Jewish people were oppressed and crushed and persecuted and massacred. And then, because of whiteness in America, we thrived and succeeded. And so as an American Jew, I ask myself, to what extent am I obligated to be part of the dismantling of the systems of oppression that have enabled me and my family to thrive, but at the cost to whom and to what? Because my family knew oppression. And so I'll just close by saying that for Jewish people, but I think there's a, a, a story and a moral for all people everywhere. The story we tell ourselves over and over again at our Passover Seder. How many of you have been to a Passover Seder? Okay, most people, Jewish or not, show up to a Passover Seder, and we are told at the Seder, you are to see yourself as if you yourself were enslaved in Egypt, that you yourself were liberated and were able to go to the promised land, and therefore you are to do what? To love the stranger. And then in our Torah, right, the first five books of the Bible, 36 different times, 36 different ways, it says you were a slave and therefore you shall love the stranger. Not tolerate, mm. not put up with, but to love the stranger. That's a call to ra radical empathy. That's what I think Dr. King meant by the beloved community, to see in the other. And Monica and I were talking about how do you get proximate to the other? Because if you're proximate, if you're in relationship, that brings about love. And to me, the racial healing is the way in which all of us, whether we are white or cis male or hetero, whatever our identities are. And by the way, most of our people have multiple identities. Mm. Ask a black queer Jew what it's like to walk through spaces in this country and in this world. But if we can dig deep into that place of love and radical empathy of other, then we can bring about the racial healing that's possible. I also loved when we were talking prior, you reminding us of the history of your community within these movements. Tell us about that. So I run the Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism, which is the site of the drafting of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So ask yourself, how could it be mm. that it was a majority white Jewish organization where this happened? Our founder was Kivy Kaplan, who like my family came to this country with nothing and was successful. But as a young person on his honeymoon in Florida, he and his newlywed wife, Emily, they were coming from the Northeast. They encountered a sign in Florida they had never seen, no Jews, no dogs. And Kivy turned to the black taxi driver who had taken them to this place of bigotry and said to the driver, is this common down here? Like, what is this? And the black taxi driver looked at him and said, 
They don't even bother with us. And Kivy understood what King was trying to teach. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So he became very involved in the NAACP. Kivy Kaplan was the last white Jewish president of the NAACP, which was in its origin largely white Jews and black Christians. And he was a major philanthropic leader in the civil rights community, but he gifted a mansion uh, in this nation's capital, DuPont Circle, to the reformed Jewish movement and founded the RAC, the Religious Action Center, but he had one caveat, that we were to be the hub of the civil rights era. So this was Jim Crow. Dr. King had no office in Washington. Dr. King would work out of the offices of a white Jewish institution in DC, and we played host to the Leadership Conference for Civil and Human Rights, is why the Civil Rights Movement was, uh, Civil Rights Act was drafted. But I say all of this to say, when I became the director in 2015, what was happening? Michael Brown, Freddie Gray, Tamir Rice, Sandra Bland. And the voice of our nation was crying out, Black Lives Matter. And we had to ask ourselves, in the 50 years where we think we've achieved so much, it's time for us to double down and return to the role we are to play as Jews and as humans as part of the multiracial intersectional movement for justice. And then, of course, in 2020, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, more names than we can name, crying out again, Black Lives Matter. And I'll just close with this. Our relationship with the Kellogg Foundation is a beautiful relationship because they have invested in us not only to do that outward organizing and relationship building for justice and racial equity, but to confront our own systems and our own experiences of racism in our own synagogues, in our own communities. 15% of the Jewish community in America is not white. Mm -hmm. There are black Jews, there are brown Jews, there are Asian Jews, there are Latino Jews, there are Jews of all hues. As all of our churches and our synagogues, our mosques, our communities are multiracial, multireligious. And so part of the racial healing of this moment is building across lines and getting proximate with one another. Absolutely. That was a longer answer to the question that I think <laughs> that you asked. I, I please, we have plenty of time. Yeah. <laughs> Say as much as you want. Um, I'm struck when you were talking about the sort of threads that you talk about through each community and, and looking to your left and right here with both Vicky and Monica as you're describing it, which makes me want to talk about the responsibility that we all have when it comes to racial healing, whether you identify with one of these communities or not. And then taking that a step further, what that means for someone who maybe doesn't identify in one of these communities and how they can partner and recognize how much what you just said is true that we all have to lift up. I want to hear from each of you on this. Vicki, I'll start with you. I think one of the ways in which to look at uh, racial equity and racial healing work is for anyone in the audience, if you've done any community organizing work, some of the core principles are of community organizing are connected to relationship building. And they are connected to our stories about who we are as human beings, our identities, our ways of being. And those relationships are absolutely necessary to build movement. We can't do that work unless we have strong, trusting relationships where we are humanizing one another. And when we are able to see and value and love and respect each other. This isn't just connected to movement building in this country. It's also connected to our own organizations and how we do work of, for example, racial equity and diversity and inclusion. Those relationships are central to how we embed racial equity, racial justice frameworks inside our communities and inside our organizations. Mm -hmm. And so for me, those principles can be applied for any single person in this room, for you to take away this moment where you're thinking about your own humanity, healing work also connects to how we love ourselves as human beings. Because when we can love ourselves, we can then love people around us. And when we are able to love each other, that is part of the equation of dealing with the divisiveness that exists in our society. There are very powerful groups in this country that want to see us divided mm -hmm. and separated from each other in oppressive systems. And it's gonna take each and every single human being to turn that around and dismantle that. And one way to do that is to focus on healing work. Very early stages of community organizing, principles of relationship development, of human trust, of loving each other because those can help us set the stage that is necessary to sustain racial equity and racial justice work. 
<laughs> Rabbi. Amen. <laughs> um, and I'm a community organizer and rabbi, so I really resonate with what Vicky said. And I, we think about this with the three R's, mm. um, reflect, relate, reform. Mm. And this is for all of us. You could be Jewish. You could be every person in this room. Reflect is like, what's my own story, both of oppression? How have I experienced oppression? How have I been traumatized? And how have I been complicit with oppression? In what ways have I othered other people? Mm -hmm. How have I been complicit with racism? Deep breath. <laughs> how am I racist? Mm -hmm. Not how am I a racist? Like, no, you're racist. But there are things I say and do that are racist. And that's yeah. to be human because it's in the oxygen, which is why none of us are free until all of us are free. Yeah. I can't be free of racism yeah. right until we're all free of racism. It, it, it makes my own soul impure. So I do my own reflection. In what ways have I oppressed other people? And then you move from the first R into relationship around listening, right? There's a rabbinic maxim. We have one mouth and two ears for a reason, right? To listen and hear others who have reflected and to learn from them and be shaped by them and be challenged by them and be loved and held by them. You know, it says in the Bible, you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. By the way, 36 times it says love the stranger. Once it says love your love your neighbor. But then the very next phrase after love your neighbor is yourself, you shall criticize your neighbor lest you bear their guilt. Mm. In other words, the rebuke in relationship, calling someone in to a moment of oppression or of racism or antisemitism or whatever it is, is an expression of love. And then in relationship, the third R, reform. Because it's about the transformation. It's not just about like kumbaya, we all can hold hands. We have systems to reform. We have policies and practices that are enduring. I know you're going to ask about this later, Savannah, so I won't go on a rant right now. But we are <laughs> seeing an unprecedented assault on equity and on rights through systems and policies that need to be dismantled. Mm, absolutely. I will ask about that later, so thank you. Monica? <laughs> and, and I'll say amen and amen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's um, one of the reasons I continue to do this work. And, and um, I started basically maybe a decade ago uh, as a racial healing practitioner. But the work is so important to me because it also uh, invites me to self-reflect. Mm. I have personally grown. I'm an artist. And so when I first started getting introduced to racial healing work, I had a question in my mind, how did they pick me? You know, how do you choose an artist to participate as a racial healing practitioner? And when I asked that question, you know, uh, Dr. Christopher said to me, I chose you because you're already doing the work. And so what I think is most of us are in ways in our communities already doing some aspect of, of healing work. We just have not identified ourselves in that way. Mm. And so for me, I have a full plate um, mm. running my organization. But what keeps me doing this work in addition to that work is because of the growth that I have seen in myself, mm. And I have seen in my organization, I have uh, trained probably somewhere around 1,500 or more racial healing practitioners around the country. And every time I ask a question and invite a person to respond to a question and tell their story, I have to reflect on my own story. And so I think the invitation always is for us to individually grow and to realize that this work that we have to do collectively, it starts with us individually. And if we can begin to face some of our own truths, mm. because nobody ever really asks us or give us a platform to tell the truth. Racial healing circles for me have been the only place where I have been asked to share my story mm -hmm. and to speak my truth in a place of safety and, and trust. 
And so I think because we've never had that invitation as individuals and human beings, we have to develop the muscle and the courage to think about our own stories and the willingness to sit with the perceived other and share those stories and the patience and the tools, develop the tools to be able to sit in the presence of someone that you don't agree with and still invite them to share those stories because it is through that exchange that we grow and that we're able to do the hard work of transformation. And if you don't mind, Monica, um, because I really would like people to walk away with an understanding of how they can maybe take some steps forward in their own community. If you don't mind getting a little granular about your work, I've just loved learning about these conversations, these circles, and, and what it really means to be a racial healing practitioner, what those conversations actually are shaped like and what you hope comes out of them. Yeah, you know, I think what I love about what, uh, you know, we talked about earlier, which is really um, a racial healing practitioner, we, we, we do a lot of preparation mm -hmm. because racial healing is not just for the healing, it's for the transformation. Mm -hmm. And so a part of my job as a racial healing practitioner is to create the container that allows people to show up and feel a level of trust that they can reflect and find their story, their authentic truth, and have the willingness to share it openly. And then those tools that I bring with me are really also to encourage them to listen differently. We have grown accustomed to being transactional. And so, you know, as a racial healing practitioner, the invitation is to learn to listen so that we can feel not only here, but we can feel, you can feel the, the, the presence of what's beneath the words. So we can then make those connections. And so I think that when we as racial healing practitioners come together with people in circles, we are thinking about and planning for the transformation. So we ask the question, what is the goal what are we trying to achieve with this circle? And if the goal is to change some policy or to uh, push on some system, then we curate the invitation. We find the right people and we bring them to together in circle. And sometimes these people are not the people who are usually together mm -hmm. having conversations. And that's where my work becomes important because I have to be grounded enough to sit in the presence of people that I don't agree with mm -hmm. and hold space for them to speak their truth. And so we can begin to strengthen and deepen relationships because there's really no way to get to transformation and systems change without the relationship building piece. And one of the reasons we continue to go backwards, we move forward, then we feel like we're moving back. Some of that has to do with the fact that we have not been invited to deepen our relationships. And because when things get heavy, the reality is systems change and transformation is a heavy lift. We are gonna get to a place where we don't agree and so without those relationships being nurtured and, and developed and deepened, then when the barriers get put in place, we normally stop and walk away. But when the relationships are nurtured, then people have the willingness to move past some of the challenges that we are gonna be presented when we're changing these systems and making these transformations. So, you know, I believe my job is to bring as much love mm -hmm. as possible into a space that invites every single person who shows up in that space mm -hmm. to feel a level of comfort and trust that I am going to ensure that their voice can be heard 
And so that's the kind of work we have to do in community because mm. we've got to invite, you know, it's, it's good to preach to the choir, <laughs> but it's more important <laughs> to bring the people who are not in the choir to the conversation because some of those folks sit in the seat of power and they are the ones who keep us from making these changes. So the best gift of a racial healing practitioner is to be able to honor every story, to love every human being. And it takes a tremendous amount of work as an individual to get there. I grew up in Alabama. Uh, that tells you I had my own baggage and I had, I come to my experience with my own biases. So my work on myself is critical to me being able to show up in a way that I can hold space for others. So that's in essence what we do as racial healing practitioners. And how, yeah, thank you for explaining it. Um, I think what you just said is so powerful, holding space and in, in your case, the act of inviting someone who you completely disagree with. I mean, that, that's just really so powerful. Um, before We're going to get to audience questions. I should have mentioned that before. So if anybody has them or start thinking about them in a little bit, before we do, I want to go back to what you had mentioned, Rabbi, about what we are up against, I guess we could say, in terms of policy, in terms of the environment, heading into you know what's expected to be this another divisive presidential election. How do you do this work in the face of that? Take a deep breath, <laughs> pray, breathe. Deep, deep. Um, and to be clear, in the racial equity and racial healing world, my work often focuses on the equity and political piece. I've learned how important the healing piece is because if we're not grounded in that place, you could, I mean, you could beat your head against a wall yeah. and, and there's a lot of trauma. The Supreme Court may roll back affirmative action any day now. A court, by the way, that exists as it exists because of a filibuster, because of a whole set of systemic racist, racist structures that came into being. Um, and I also mentioned, you know, in 2015, when I came to this role, it wasn't just, you know, Freddie Gray and Tamir Rice and, and Sandra Bland, et cetera. It was also like Shelby V. Holder, which rolled back the Voting Rights Act. So if you care about democracy and voting rights, everybody should go 10 years upstream and understand what happened when the Voting Rights Act, which is a beloved, the most important piece of civil rights legislation in, in the history of this country, maybe the world, got eviscerated by the Supreme Court, state after state after state, rolls back voting rights. Um, one was a North Carolina uh, um, uh, gerrymandering that a federal appeals court called racist with surgical precision all across the country, and what Michelle Alexander would call the new Jim Crow, mass incarceration. Mm -hmm. So we are in a, an environment, and then of course we have elected officials who get elected by not just playing into racist yeah. tropes, but by like running on racist tropes, and we see what's happening. I also have to just add, as part of that, there's not just the policies, there's the bigoted rhetoric that leads to violence. So just this weekend, as people were arriving here, Temple Beth Israel in Macon, Georgia, was attacked by Nazis out there with their hateful signs that were homophobic. So like, just, this is Charlottesville, Jews will not replace us. It's a Confederate monument. This is the Confederacy. Hold, this is, if you're not sure about the way these things intersect, racism, anti-Semitism, anti-Muslim bigotry, uh, homophobia, and all of the other isms, it's around this like mm -hmm. gasping of the Confederacy to hold on to the way America was mm -hmm. when everything was good. And I'm gonna share with you that though I'm really scared, the assault on the Capitol, January 6th, right, was a white supremacist, Confederate flag-waving, racist, anti-Semitic, Camp Auschwitz, right? It's really scary right now. And the Tree of Life shooting, okay, in which a million of my people were massacred, I was there within hours of the shooting, but here's what I saw. This is what I witnessed. One night after, while the families were still grieving, tens of thousands of people showed up in Soldiers and Sailors Hall, 
overflowing out in the streets. They had to have jumbotrons to broadcast this interfaith multiracial vigil. And it was the whole Jewish community, but it was the full multiracial array of the Pittsburgh community. And sitting in that room, I saw Wazi Muhammad, the leader of the Muslim community, stand up and say, the Muslim community is committed to defending and protecting our Jewish family. We will raise the money for all of the funerals and the healthcare costs of those who are impacted. And then Vincent Kolb, a prominent black pastor, got up there and said, let us remember three things. Number one, this was an attack on Jews, and an attack on Jews is an attack on all of us. But number two, just three days ago, two black people were shot at a supermarket because the church that the shooter wanted to go into was locked because of Mother Emanuel shooting some years ago. And he said, third, let's remember this synagogue was targeted because it was celebrating refugee Shabbat. It's a solidarity congregation. This was a shooter who believes in the great replacement lie that there's a global Jewish conspiracy to turn America black, brown, and Muslim through policy and immigration and voting. And the people in that room started chanting, vote, vote, vote. Mm -hmm. I really believe that our safety as minorities and as all people will come through our solidarity, if we actually do this racial healing work and we learn to love and be in relationship with one another, we actually can be the beloved community and the redemption of this country, despite the 400 years of systemic racism, despite all of its challenges, could come through a democracy if it were truly multiracial, inclusive, in which if every voice really was heard because every vote really was counted, then the policies would actually reflect the community that would allow every person to thrive. So what we're up against is a huge challenge, but we have the capacity to overcome that challenge if we come together as a multiracial, interfaith, pluralistic, and inclusive democracy. Mm-hmm. Vicki, I know you want to say something, and I also want to ask you anything you want to say, but also just with that backdrop that Rabbi Jonah has just set for us, what gives you hope to doing this work? I love that question, and I also just want to say amen to Monica and and amen to to Rabbi Pessner because (laughs) sharing this space with them is just like such a, it's such a beautiful gift because they are individuals and human beings who give me hope. Mm. And when I sit in this moment, these are the gifts that I I, I take away because it's it's human beings like us on this stage that we're, we're completely different communities, completely different backgrounds, ethnicities, racial backgrounds, identities, who we are as human beings, but at our core, love is a part of our center. Part of what I also wanted to to, to double down on is that as we go into this next election season, that racist dehumanizing rhetoric that exists now will only continue to escalate. And as we go into that season, healing work, if you're not already doing it, start it now. Because that is what is going to see us through what is going to be happening in the next two to three years. That is going to help us build the muscle that is necessary to fortify every single person to deal with that racist, divisive, divisive, dehumanizing rhetoric. For me, as I continue to see communities work through this every day, I see the struggles, I see how people are working against oppressive systems, and at the same time, I see these moments of hope that just fill me with love and joy. Like for example, just two days ago, I was sitting in a group of young community organizers that are working towards movement building in this country that actively bring in healing practices to their own work. Mm because they know it's necessary. Their families have have helped build this foundation for them. They know how to build their own muscle towards healing that is needed for them to sustain them and fortify them in this work. Mm -hmm. And for me, as an indigenous person, we have this philosophy of seven generations into the future. My decisions today have a ripple effect into seven generations of children in the future my hope and my legacy for the rest of my life, I am going to continue to work on racial equity and dismantling systemic racism and the impact of colonization. Because I do not want a single generation of children in the future to continue to inherit these these oppressive systems. 
And so for me, love and hope is center. It's central to all of that. And so for me, that's where I find my hope is especially in young people today that are working towards change. I see you in the audience, for example, not to put you on the spot, so forgive me. I just, when I see you, I see hope, I see love, I see possibility. Yes. You're amazing. <laughs> so thank you for being here. We're about to get to audience questions, but Monica, I'd love to just lastly hear from you on that point of hope. What brings you hope? And I know you see so many of these faces at <laughs> Little Black Pearl. Um, I, I think for me, first I want to say that, you know, we can love and disagree. Hmm. Mm. You know what I mean? So... One of the things that I think is really important is to make sure that whatever we do is grounded in love. Uh, because love is the only thing that can conquer hate. And that's the stuff we're dealing with right now. And what brings me hope is that every time I sit in circle and every time I am with people who are in complete disagreement, I have found that when they are able to share a story with one another about their lives, truly, um, I have found that there have, there's been a window and a door that opens that allows people's hearts to change. And to, uh, there have been people that I would never imagine would be open to doing anything positive in relationship to people of color. And I have watched love. I have watched um, the, the connection between a story that was shared with them that resonated with them in their hearts that invited them to make a different decision. So I think as long as we're human beings and as long as we have breath, we have the opportunity to choose love. We have the opportunity to make a different choice. And that's what keeps me hopeful because I know that in every moment we have that choice. We have that choice to choose love over hate. And those that are creating all of the divisiveness and the darkness in this country and around the world, we have the opportunity to overpower that with love. And, and that keeps me hopeful. Mm -hmm. A great note to end this part of the conversation on. You all are so fantastic. Um, we have lots of audience questions. I believe mics will be coming. I'll start right here. Wow. Thank you. Look at this. I want to thank you. This panel has given me hope for the first time in a long time. As a Jewish person, who grew up in Wisconsin and had a special love for the Indians and the Dells, yeah. and pictures of me standing with wonderful chieftains, and as somebody who was always very proud of the Jewish black work during civil rights, I have two questions. What is the rise of anti-Semitism coming from now? Mm. And are there more than you guys doing this work? Because I didn't know there was such a thing as this. And uh, how do we get to know more about it and teach others to do it? Fantastic questions. I'll, I'll answer the last question, which is, uh, you know, there are racial healing practitioners all over this country, and they are doing extraordinary work in communities everywhere. There are racial healing practitioners in the libraries, at the uh, Library Association. There are practitioners on the college campuses. So through Kellogg, we've had the opportunity to train people for the last, you know, I've been training probably for the last six or seven years, and I've had the opportunity to train many people who are doing extraordinary work. So I would encourage you, uh, we have a National Day of Racial Healing. Uh, I would invite you to go to Kellogg's website. There's a tremendous amount of information there that will lead you to the places where you can make connections with other racial healing practitioners. We have uh, uh, hundreds of folk everywhere that are really moving this work forward. So the invitation is for you to absolutely mm. join us and we will provide any supports 
that we can as racial healing practitioners to really move the work that you're doing in your communities forward. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic, yeah, please. Yeah, I think to add to that uh, too as, as well with Monica and her expertise as a racial healing practitioner, I also just want to encourage when I talked about building your own practice and starting it, the Kellogg Foundation, we encourage you to visit our website, dayofracialhealing.org. That's an incredibly helpful resource. If you want to engage in this kind of work, how you do it, how you engage in conversations around racial equity or racial topics. And then my colleagues, Michael and Stephanie and Neil, they're in the back of the audience. <laughs> Uh, they will have, they have got some conversation guides available as well as some additional information in case you're interested in learning more. Amazing. Rabbi, do you want to take I the mean, first part of that? I mean, you know, 3,000 years of anti-Semitism hard to distill into a talking point, but let me say two things. First of all, gratitude for, to Kellogg that have centered a white Jewish rabbi mm -hmm. in the solidarity and racial healing work. They understand the intersectional analysis. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I will say is that like by nature, from the time that Abraham and Sarah rejected the notion that God was in an idol or a stone, but there was some power greater than ourselves, mm -hmm. Jews stood outside the existing order as critics. When you stand outside the existing order, when you criticize white supremacy, white supremacy fights back, right? These things are all related. So Deborah Lipstadt calls it the oldest form of hatred, not because it's worse than other forms of hatred, but throughout history, the Jew has played the role of who do we blame for what's happening right now? So there's a lot bad happening right now. So again, it's not at the expense of the utter truth of anti-black racism or of homophobia or of the continuing assault on native peoples, but Jews then become the like, why everything's wrong. So I think what you're seeing now is a spike in that kind of scapegoating. Mm -hmm. wow. uh, right here. Right into the mic. Okay. Um, I just want to introduce myself real quick. My name is Victoria Myers. I'm from Dallas, Texas, and I'm with the Bezos Scholars Program. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> and um, what I heard from Rabbi Pessner um, is that the problem is that there's a lack of representation. Um, you can't share experiences if, without being represented. And my thing is, the flaw with democracy is that there's an overlooking of the minority. And also, the minority could be the majority if the groups just look past each other's differences and we realize that we're all the same and that um, there's not really differences between each other. So we could be the majority. But my question is, how can we be united by bringing up the minority to engage with the overbearing power of the majority and those who don't see a change and um, being able to learn to love and that you can love and still disagree. So how can we bring up the minority to engage with the majority? Monica, I feel like some of that was a direct quote. <laughs> <laughs> you, <laughs> um, you know, I, I think this, when we think about this work, it's good to think about it as a journey. You know, it's really an opportunity for us to use some of the tools, you know, usually, you know, we have not been given tools to um, find ways to bring us together. The systems and everything are designed for us to be separated. So through racial healing and through some of the opportunities of bringing community together, we now have a tool that helps us to bring voices together that are different. And to, to do that in a way that we're honoring each other and we can trust that we can save what we believe and what we've experienced in an environment where we're not going to be mistreated. And so as we do that more often, the easier it will become for us to be more united. And so it's going to take this perpetual effort to keep sharing stories. One of the things that I think is important is really for us to do racial healing work in our homes, mm -hmm. do it in our work, mm -hmm. do it in our communities. And there are tools that are available uh, through Kellogg and other places where you can learn to do that better, where you can learn to 
invite people to be in conversation and we can begin to become one human family because this is about creating the world we want to live in and not necessarily the one we live in. I, one of the questions I always ask people that's a hard question for them to answer is do you believe racism can be eliminated? Mm. And so we got to believe it first mm -hmm. before it can actually happen. Mm. Great answer. Oh, I don't like the pressure of choosing. I want, <laughs> I don't know if you guys, said, if we can keep going to get through questions. Go ahead. Hi, good morning. My name is Sid Wilson. I'm the president and CEO of the Hispanic Association on Corporate Responsibility in Washington, D.C. Um, I'm also a member of the, um, the CEO Action for Racial Equity um, that is bringing together CEOs to really bring, you know, really address this issue. My question for all of you is, what's your message to corporate America particularly the ones that are stand on the sidelines um, that need to step in and lean in on not only racial healing, but making sure that they are a part of their solution by encouraging their employees uh, to be able to be bring their full present uh, selves in the workforce and when they leave the work, uh, outside the workforce. So what are your, what's, your, what's your message for corporate America on this? Mm. Great question. I appreciate that question so much because one of the aspects that I wanna lift up is that the Kellogg Foundation, we have a program that addresses exactly that. It's, it's framed as the Expanding Equity Program. And that particular program is working specifically with companies in the, the DEI space. One of the things that we put forward, especially to companies, is that we can't afford you to be silent. We need you to be in this work. We need you to be able to, it's not just about messaging but it's, it's within the companies themselves doing their own racial equity work, doing their healing work in terms of addressing various sectors and the impacts on communities, but it's also looking outward. How can CEOs in particular come forward, step in to be, to be that voice, to be leaders in this space? Because companies play a significant role in this country in terms of how we engage in DEI work how companies engage across communities, the kinds of sectors that we're serving and supporting the employees that work within these companies and the, the worker rights issues. But in particular, I think moving past the silence is gonna be especially important, especially going in, into these next two to three years. We see the impact of continued decisions from the US Supreme Court as we continue to see whomever gets elected into office and this next election season is pivotal. And so companies play a role in this. There is a voice there that is necessary and that's needed and it needs to be sustained. Mm. Four more words, yeah. it's good for business. <laughs> yes. Look at Unilever, <laughs> black hair products. Mm. Like what were they thinking for all of those years of no hair products for black people? Like it's a market left on the table. It's good for business, so thank you for what you're doing. Yeah, great question too. I think we have to wrap. We have to wrap. I think they need the space. Uh, uh, I know we could keep going. Maybe we can all kind of cool. hang. Oh, can I? Thank you. Thank you.